What is it about falling snow that just makes all of your troubles fade away? In the mountains, the double digits in your bank account, that stack of bills at home, are nagging chores like laundry, dirty dishes, and garbage day. None of it matters. Skiing is a way of connecting with what the mountains offer, and it's one of the few things you can do in life that truly engages you in the moment. Being in nature helps you gain a greater appreciation for wild lands, and a greater understanding of how everything in this world is ultimately connected to each other. Through the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the environments that we all share and depend on. As cliche as this all may be, there's an element of truth to it. The mountains are a place that ignites your soul. They provide one of the most profound senses of freedom that exist on this planet, and I, like so many others I know, am completely obsessed with that feeling. My dad taught me the art of a good powder call when I was just a little kid, and I pretty much do it all the time now. I think it's become a real problem. I grew up exploring the forest behind my house, surfing at the beaches nearby, and finding freedom skiing every weekend in the mountains. Nearly three decades later, and I still haven't lost that stoke for a good old fashioned pow slash. I've since become an adult. Well, kind of. I make my living filming people doing some pretty cool things outside, but these days it feels like I share my profession with any 12 year old who owns a GoPro, so it really can't be all that difficult. I've helped make all sorts of movies, traveled to some amazing places, and even worked a few desk jobs, but I can never figure out how to make those things last. An ex-girlfriend of mine used to say that I would just escape to the mountains every time life got serious, and yeah, she may have been right. I've spent my entire life chasing that freedom that skiing provided, and trying to capture moments like these through images, but over the years I felt a growing distance between myself and that passion. This last job I had was managing social media for a big outdoor sports company, and it opened my eyes to the way that simple world of skiing had become so much more complex. I saw my friends become numbers on pieces of paper, and my life's work reduced to an intangible measurement of likes, shares, and comments. The world today has evolved into one of constant connection, a sea of distraction that's changed everything from the way we interact, communicate, and even meet people. It seems that people no longer do things for the love of it, but instead just to show others what they've done, to get approval from followers they didn't even know. What happened to the passion, the soul of skiing? It was all too overwhelming for me, so I did what I always did whenever life got serious. I rounded up a group of friends and we ran off to the mountains. There we were in the heart of Tokyo, the highest population concentration of the world, and the beginning of our six week journey. The crew consisted of myself, there to try to direct this junk show. Anna, who spoke a few dozen words of Japanese, quickly became our translator. Carl had come along pretty much just to eat, and Jasper was on a mission to try every piece of candy out there. Andy was there to keep us motivated for early morning wake up calls, and his girlfriend, Shannon, thought Japan would be a good place to try going gluten free. For the record, it isn't. Waking up early with a fresh case of jet lag, we did what any six kooks in a big foreign city would do. We went exploring. Oh, yeah. Picking that one. Or that one, or that one. Are we at Shin Kansen? Can you read that? Come 
might be it. We got a little mini RC racer. RC? Or should I get Pikachu's? While shopping for RC cars and socks is fun, there was more to this trip than just treasure hunting in Tokyo and skiing POW. Anna was raised in downtown Melbourne, Australia, which makes her one of the last people you'd have guessed to develop an affinity for skiing. After years of racing, moguls, and slopestyle competition, Anna had quickly become one of the top girls in the field. And even with the odds against her, she managed to place fourth a little thing called the Olympics or whatever. No big deal. I was particularly excited about slopestyle being added as an Olympic sport because I knew that it would give me a chance to experience this historic event. But then on the other side, I knew that it was going to bring a lot more structure and rigidity to like the thing that I love doing. And the reason I loved doing it was because of a lack of structure and rigidity. When I look back, I'm like, oh my God, just imagine if I'd gotten third. I have to like put myself in that mindset that I was in the Olympics and be like, you're kidding yourself. Like you did better than you could have dreamt about given that you had no ACL, you had the flu, you hadn't had sleep. Like it's hard to reason with yourself. And I guess the one thing tugging at me, like maybe I would want to do the Olympics again, would be to get that elusive medal. And then at the same time, it's like, would going to the Olympics again really make me happy? Or is it just to get a medal that legitimizes what I do to everyone that doesn't understand? Even though I was committed to the Olympics, seeing like the content online made me jealous and it made me question what I was doing and whether the path that I'd picked was the right one for me. I decided this year to take a break from competing and um, try and pursue like some more filming and photography. It's probably the most common question amongst my friends and family is, oh, are you going to go for the next Olympics? When are they? I guess I've felt this pressure to not give them a definite answer, even though in my own mind, like, I'm pretty sure that I don't want to go to the next Olympics and I want to pursue this other side of skiing. I always feel like I'm letting them down saying no. Yeah, let's like waste half our battery power. If I had known then how annoying those little cars would end up being on this trip, I would have smashed them right there in the street. Carl would have been so bummed. There's more to this homely looking character than meets the eye. With an official degree in environmental studies and an unofficial one in obscure wisdom, the fact that he's grown from a groomer ripping Grom to one of the most forward thinking skiers today is hardly a surprise. YouTube didn't exist back then, so I couldn't you know, go watch viral videos. I only had a few different DVDs. You know, I was just a little kid watching these guys skiing and just blown away by what they could do. And now sometimes I can only make it 30 seconds through a video and it's on to the next one. In this day and age, the bar is set so high and people are out in the mountains doing absolutely insane stuff and you're able to see that the next day on the internet. And so there's definitely a pressure when you're out there to really push yourself and push the boundaries. In many ways, this has been my ode to Urban. Um, Urban's definitely been good to me and helped me establish myself, but uh, I think my true potential is in the backcountry. And before I really started to focus on that, I just wanted to get all these stupid Urban features done. It's awesome in this day and age of social media to always stay up to date with what's going on, and that's kind of changed just because of the amount of content available. 
you know, it's unlikely that someone's gonna watch a video I make more than two or three times before a new video pops up in their feed and they get distracted. So uh, figuring out ways to stand out is difficult. Given that his hometown population maxes out at 800, I'm pretty sure that was the most people, lights, and noise Andy had ever witnessed in one place. With a family that lived at the ski area and an Olympic medalist father-uncle duo, he was born into a life in the mountains. Andy and I grew up skiing together, and while I tinkered with cameras, he went on to help revolutionize the sport, doing some pretty innovative stuff on skis. I feel like it used to be like word of mouth. If a bunch of people heard about it, it's because a bunch of people are talking about it to each other, and now nobody has to talk to anybody about it. You know, I occasionally get on. I don't really post a lot nowadays, which I should be a little better about. It's just not necessarily for me. I'd rather just do things. I don't really need to share that I'm doing things. We're past the middle of December at this point, and uh, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, things aren't really doing too well as far as snowpack goes. I don't know how all my sponsors feel about me not skiing right now, but I think it'll be all good. I haven't really been doing any social media. It's cool to be able to catch up with people or see what other people are doing, but at the same time, it's kind of, uh, Kind of stupid. I mean, hell, the first half of my life it wasn't really around, and now it's like a staple, must do this to fit in. Hey, what's up? Yeah, no, I get it. But yeah, I can make some stuff happen on it. I don't really know how to... Yeah, you do the same. What a... He sounded pissed. Oh, yeah. He's not happy. So you have like 3,000 followers on your Instagram and... <laughs> 20, 29 on your Facebook. <laughs> like, he's like, this isn't gonna cut it, man. We can't keep paying you what we do if you don't have more. So, yeah. I got five months away from the garbage, which was awesome. Now I gotta go back into it, sadly. Maybe I should just quit. Get a real job. Not to do this stupid shit. <clears throat> I know what you're probably thinking right now. First world problems, right? Absolutely. But it brings up larger questions of how we all spend our time, what influences us, and whether any of that helps us pursue whatever it is that actually makes us happy. The modern world of expectations, distractions, and obligations had smothered the things that we loved, and we had become lost. In our own ways, we all found ourselves on the other side of the world seeking clarity on our paths, and to rediscover those moments that had made it all worthwhile. Yeah, I saw Pep's Instagram today, and he's tits deep and pow, and definitely made me jealous. Well, it makes you like anxious, kind of. like makes you kind of not happy with where you are. I know if you have like remote control cars though, they get pretty interested oh, in what definitely. you're doing. Yeah, everyone's going like, Where did you get those? The <laughs> <a> good icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think I'm gonna have to start calling my car is the icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that, Blitzer? <laughs> Let's get to the mountains, go ski some powder. It didn't take long for the hustle and bustle of the big city to wear us thin, so we hopped on a train and headed west. 
In typical ski tourist fashion, we picked up a sick van in Nagano and immediately had issues driving on the other side of the road. Probably not supposed to be in this lane. Within a few hours, the suburban landscape around us slowly faded to hillsides, and we found ourselves in the snow once again. I've never seen it snow this much ever in my life. It doesn't do this in Australia. <laughs> Go oh, easy on the poor old icebreaker. <laughs> Our first morning in the mountains, we woke up to three feet of fresh snow. Stoke levels were through the roof. We had no choice but to ditch the cameras and go ski pow. But trust me, it was awesome. Unlike the winter back home, the snow in Japan just kept on falling. It was all a matter of timing, and we couldn't have timed it any better than we did. Our legs were sore and faces frozen into smiles, but something just still wasn't right. Back at the hotel, we found ourselves caught up in the same distractions that had governed our lives back home. One night, it all came to a tipping point, and an idea was brought up that changed the rest of the trip, but not until after Carl was done unloading some really serious problems on all of us. The worst is when you see like a feature that you've been wanting to hit, and then like you're scrolling through Facebook and like someone hit it. Do you even have a Facebook, Andy? Mm hmm You can go check it out. I don't know when I uh, posted on them last, but... Well, why do you have it then if you don't use it? It's a good question. <laughs> At least in this line of work, you're almost required to use it as a marketing tool, you know? Mm -hmm. And that ends up taking the fun out of it. What do you guys think about, like, disconnecting from all of social media for the rest of the trip like you think we can all last a few weeks without Easy. constant updates here's to the here and now i'll put a fist out there <laughs> we came to agree that as a group we'd all disconnect from our internet and social media devices with the sporadic exception of emails for family or business matters me personally not using Facebook and Instagram and whatever is relatively easy, but uh, that's not the same for the rest of the group. Some of the people are going to have a hard time giving that up. He actually, is he doing it? No, he's just going Jasper, out of here. Jasper, deactivate your Facebook account. I'm not going on Facebook. No, but just deactivate it. You can reactivate it afterwards. You don't lose all your friends. They'll still be your friends. Yeah, it's already causing a little bit of tension, I feel, and it's only been 12 hours. <laughs> wow. So hopefully here within the next 12 days, everybody will forget about all that shit and realize life is actually way better without it. I feel like this morning it's caused a little bit of tension in the group. You know, some people are really down for the cause and other people are just making excuses. Uh, I need to delete my Facebook messenger. Why can't we just live in the moment and like be happy with who we're around?
stoked on that one. Our ridiculous bickering was even more distant after some quality airtime and pillow lines. I don't think there's any number of Facebook likes that could ever rival the feeling of a good pow slash. But the storm had ended, and it was time for us to move further into the mountains. I've been reading bits and pieces of a book called Buddhism for Beginners, and I guess the thing that really hit home for me was the Buddhist philosophy, non-attachment which is not disattachment, it's not disattaching from people, but not being attached to things and ideas and preconceptions and all that kind of thing. And rather than me expecting that we're going to get blow of power every day in Japan, just arriving here and being like, oh, cool, well, what will be will be. We might get a grey bird day with no fresh snow. We might get a blue bird day with epic snow, but, you know, we'll make the best of each day as it comes. Our next stop was a tiny homestay in a remote mountain village, complete with rural Japanese furnishing, paper-thin insulation, and kerosene heaters for a one-of-a-kind experience. We sparked a little fuel and we'll have this place heated up in no time. Gonna get a good night of sleep tonight. We woke up the next morning with a chill in the air to meet our caretaker, Mori. After a few passages of broken Japanglish, he invited us over to meet his family. Hey, bud, I gotta go eat breakfast. <laughs> they cooking me. <laughs> over the next few days, we ate there every night for dinner. And without our phones or computers nearby, we came to know the family quite well. After our first meal, Mori's mother, Kyoko, had quickly earned the nickname of Mama Cook Boss because, well, that food was insanely good. She even gave us a few pointers. No, I didn't expect to get a cooking lesson, but he's teaching me how to make my favorite bean recipe, which we've had the last two nights. <laughs> Kyoko was the most positive, bubbly, and energetic person any of us had ever met. Always happy to share her stories, culture, and tradition with us. Even though we were all out of our comfort zone on the other side of the Pacific, her kindness made us all feel at home. After dinner one night, our friend Akira gave us some intel on some good touring spots in the area. We weren't the type to turn down local knowledge, so we set off for the hills. Touring up through the snow-covered trees was such a peaceful change from the city and the resorts that we were used to riding. And it may have been the first time on the trip where we all really began to embrace where we were and the people that we were there with. <laughs> What's going on here, Blitzer? Blitzer, <laughs> <laughs> this <is a> good <laughs> Blake. I mean, yeah, I think everyone has attachment issues. We all have them and it's, it's hard to break away from them. Um, I think it may be easier if we can all try and do it as a group and that's what I'm really hoping that everyone kind of lives to their word and really does try their best to be non-attached to their phones or their image or their ideas of what this trip should or should not be.
you doing there, Carl? Uh, just watched the teaser for the new Bunch film. Popped on here to check out my GPS, and then once you're in, you're in, man. What you doing? <laughs> and I really want to share it on my Facebook, but I can't, man. And now I feel guilty for connecting. I also may have checked Instagram for my computer. <laughs> because... <laughs> Everyone had acted so confident, but disconnecting from our internet vices was proving to be much more difficult than we thought it would be. The definition of acceptable emails continued to be pushed, and we even caught Mr. Anti-Internet Mayor streaming motocross videos at one point. Well, I'm about to play some music. How are you doing that? Uh, little thing called YouTube. Welcome to the future, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> the other day I checked my email and my mom was like, are you still alive? And then I was like, you know, made this excuse like, oh, I can't write her back, like I'm not allowed to be on the internet. Okay, well why are you, like, you're connected enough to watch Candide's thing and to watch the bunch things, but you're not, you're not able to respond to your mom when she writes you a worried email? Okay. She said that three days ago. Hey, mom. I'm alive and having fun. I am alive and having fun. The main purpose of these technologies is to easily connect us to the things we care about, but this easy connection to anything we wanted also made it easy to abuse. Without even realizing it, these networks had just become another one of our time-wasting habits, rather than the valuable tools they were meant to be. Even though I know and you know that we've been killing it, if we aren't telling the rest of the world about that on the internet, you know, they kind of think like, oh, like, what's going on with Crazy Carl? He's probably just being a piece of shit this year. Just <laughs> you know, I've been guilty of going out and just getting a picture of doing something that you're not even really doing. It's not that other people see you experience it that counts. It's that you actually experienced it. There's definitely a catch-22 in this career path, and that's that to do what you love, you have to publicize it. And so, how do you do that without selling out and staying true to your own vision? At times it seems like a waste of time. And you're like, I'm meant to be this outdoor athlete and you're sitting there stuck on your iPhone trying to edit a photo and tag all the right people. It's like, what am I doing? You have this way to share with a broader audience larger concerns, but I feel a lot of times these big concerns are overshadowed by the smaller ones, you know, where there's definitely some serious problems all around the world, but Jim in Colorado having a flat tire is not one of them. Kyoko had spoken to us about this Japanese term, tamashi. It refers to one's spirit or passions, and it's a life force that connects us all. She believed that by giving her love and positivity to every foreigner that came to the homestay, her Tamashi would be spread bit by bit by each of them to help make the entire world a better place. It sounded a bit heavy to us at first, but the more we thought about it, the more we considered our own Tamashi. As individuals, as friends, and within our communities, there was a common set of passions, a unifying sense of soul that connected us all. But what was it? <laughs> In my daily routine, I definitely miss a lot of present moments that I could gain a lot of knowledge and insight from and I'm just too busy looking forward and back and then I miss what's right in front of me.今この場に集中するフォーカスすることで誰もが思ってなかった未来とかみんなが どうしても囚われてしまうことが相当多いです。あの、そうしたあのアイデアのこう
we hadn't gone about this whole thing of disconnecting, I'm sure I'd been checking up on everything. But I've slowly started to like pull myself away from that and like it wasn't easy and it still isn't easy. Um, but I think slowly I'm just getting more relaxed about the whole checking what's going on around the world. It's really nice just how much extra time you find in a day when you aren't sitting there checking Facebook or scrolling through Instagram. And it's good not to be plugged into those things day in and day out. I feel like you become more connected in the here and now and the place where you actually are. I guess X Games is probably on right about now and they just had world champs a week ago and it's really good, it's kind of helping me focus more on what I need to do rather than what other people are doing. Yes! <laughs> I think the importance of being present is that there's less second guessing, you know? You don't look back and go, oh, shoulda, woulda, coulda. You don't look forward and think, oh, how are my actions going to affect what I do in the future? All your focus is on the now and like, the more focus you have and the more clarity you have on like the present moment, the better you're going to be able to perform in whatever activity you're trying to do. Often our schedule is so important for us to stick to and certain tasks are so important for us to get done and then you get out into these mountains and you realise how small and insignificant you really are. Through being present in the moment and disconnecting from our distractions, we were able to rediscover all the things that truly made us happy. There's just so many things outside that you can lose yourself in that you don't have to worry about all the other things that are going on, you're able to escape. To experience it yourself is quite amazing. Suddenly there's not a coffee stand 100 feet away. You know, there's absolutely nothing. And at the same time, there's a lot of everything out there.
we were beyond stoked. The expectations and pressures from our realities no longer mattered. The past was forgotten and the future unimagined. We took every day as it came, knowing that nothing lasts forever. Those little cars had broken down and were replaced with helicopters, but even those didn't last very long. Oh, God. Us camera guys started to see the hypocrisy in documenting everything all the time, and we cut loose. Just a few days earlier, Jasper had stomped a double backy and was still high on that stoke. <laughs> Shannon had gotten a few photos of her own, and I even found the time to shred a line from a conky, camera pack and all. We were all just having some good old fashioned fun, and in the end, isn't that why we do anything? Along with that powder call, my dad also taught me that change is the only constant in life, although it had never made much sense until now. Things are always changing, and in trying to hang on to these fleeting bits of time, we end up missing the great moments of now. It's there we find what's really important in our lives, what's worth letting go of, and the things that are worth protecting and passing on for others to enjoy. Our time in Japan had come to an end, and on a global scale, we hadn't really accomplished much. We hadn't cured cancer, poverty, or world hunger, and the climate was still changing. But by taking time to look up and enjoy the moments that made it all worthwhile, we fell in love with the outdoors all over again. We found our passion, our soul, our tamashi, and we learned that that's where anything truly worth doing always begins. Mm -hmm.